Everybody bring your own foo. Um, okay, and our, uh, the speaker for this session is William De Bruyne. He's going to tell us about, remember all those RPC things we talked about all day? He's going to tell us how to measure whether they actually work. So take it away. Thank you, Srijit. Um, yeah, um, that's, we've been talking about latency um, and performance. And one of the things that we had to do, I work at Google, for our fleet is measure this fleet wide and really understand where latency comes from. So we're not going to talk about making things fast, but understanding where the latency accrues. So this talk is about um, the uh, Linux kernel timestamping API, uh, which we use for this. And at Google, we uh, the last couple of years, we've added a bunch of extensions to what is already a very obscure corner of the socket API. Um, and I think every extension, there's a git commit and you can you know learn what it does, but we've never really given the, the, the story how they come together to implement fleet-wide monitoring. So I, I hope to do that here. Um, and the reason I do it now is that uh, in September, we had a SICCOM paper on something called Fathom, which is our fleet-wide passive monitoring system. Um, a lot of communication at Google is RPC-based, and all these RPC messages are um, uh, at least a sample on a sample basis. They are uh, measured, they are tracked. Uh, where in the stack is this message? Um, it's a, a single, essentially um, fleet-wide, planet-scale distributed database with information about our RPCs. And um, Fathom will tell you where in its lifespan does the, the latency for this RPC accrue? Uh, where did that happen and why, which is a very important second part of the question. Fathom is based on something that we already had before called Dapper that we published like 13 years ago, our colleagues did, which is that distributed database, um, but uh, Dapper is fully user space and Fathom extends it into the kernel. And the part that um, I, I hope to talk to you about today that's not entirely in the Fathom paper is a lot of the X-ray information that Fathom gets, it gets from the Linux kernel and how. Um, so uh, debugging your individual messages, your individual TCP connection, um, and scaling that up to fleet-wide continuous monitoring is one use case of uh, timestamps in the kernel. There are other uh, valid use cases, delay-based congestion control. Um, if a, a congestion control algorithm wants to know what the network um, uh, RTT is, you want to measure that as close as possible to the network, so not in the application layer. Uh, I think P2P clock synchronization is the most classic use case of uh, timestamps, uh, but that's a relatively low rate operation. It's only control messages for P2P, whereas uh, delay-based congestion control needs this for potentially every packet of every flow. So it changes the requirements. Um, and, uh, and even applications increasingly want to use this. Uh, two examples are um, strongly consistent distributed databases that basically order events in time um, and they use this uncertainty window to know whether two events on a distributed system might have happened before or after or during each other. And the smaller the uh, uncertainty window is, the more scalable the database becomes. Um, so they want um, precise, accurate timestamps. And financial markets, they similarly, um, when you uh, basically have a couple of uh, uh, users bidding for some object, uh, whoever bids the same price first should get it, so they really care about this kind of stuff. But we're going to focus on the latency debugging today. So in, in the beginning, which maybe is like 10 years ago or so, um, our latency debugging went a little bit like this. As I said, Dapper would have a lot of information about RPCs in user space, where they spent their time, but then eventually an RPC was basically passed to the kernel in a, in a send call. Um, and the response would come back, and well, that was the latency of the network, and we didn't really know what was going on at this layer, which is obviously a pretty big oversight. Um, generally, what happened was application engineers who noticed this and cared enough about it would find our network operators and go to them and complain that the, our network was slow, which suited me as a kernel engineer very well. Uh, but our network operators knew better, and they said, well, hold on. I'm pretty sure it's not my network, right? I have some information on my network. Go talk to the Linux kernel networkers, network team. Um, and quite often they were right. So at the very minimum, what we want to do is to be able to say whether the problem is in the network or it's in the um, operating system. It's pretty low bar, the most important question to answer. Uh, because if you look at the operating system stack, this is really the classic uh, OS stack, um, the TCP layer might delay um, data because um, flow control, for instance, 
um, when TCP releases a packet, it might be sitting in the traffic shaping layer in the Linux Q disk uh, because of um, some uh, policy on uh, bandwidth um, um, sharing, for instance, or on QoS. Um, so those are both variable length, variable length causes of latency. Um, we assume that most of the rest of the stack is essentially constant um, duration, when, in which case it's not that interesting to measure. Um, so originally we had essentially only the green bar, um, blocks at the top, transmit and receive latency at the application level. Uh, what we want, ideally, is at the bottom, as close to the network as possible, to measure this RPC you know, is now on the network, or this RPC has now arrived from the network. Um, that needs NIC support. It needs NIC time time support at line rate. Um, if you don't have that, the operating system will abstract the hardware. So we can do this in software in the device drivers. And then for these cases, such as TCP and, and the QDisk, where you can have variable length delay that you know massively swamps whatever network RTT, uh, we want to add additional data points, additional measurement points in the stack. Um, so that is, that is essentially what SO time stepping gives us. So I'll just go back to the basics of this somewhat obscure abstention to the socket API. Um, this summary, you can also uh, read the documentation in the upstream Linux kernel. We have three time stamping interfaces. Um, SO time stamp will only give you a receive time stamp in microsecond for your, for your socket. SO time stamp NS nanosecond extended with nanosecond support. And then what we're going to focus on today, as with time stamping, extends this by giving you the option to measure at different points in your data path. So the SO timestamp interface is um, to get timestamps on your sockets. This is, you do a set sock opt, um, it's a Boolean, and now every packet that comes in will have a received software timestamp associated with it. Time stamping is a little bit more complicated. You have to, instead of a Boolean, you have to pass a bitmap of flags of what you want to measure, and we'll get to which ones uh, exist. Um, so now, um, if timestamp is available, it will be reported. Receiving requires C messages. This has come up a couple of times today already, this uh, um, side channel essentially to pass data along with the packet. Um, so, um, if, if the application has to use receive message to pass control data to the kernel, and a control data will be filled in with these messages, and if you find an SCM timestamping message, then there is this struct which evidently has a, um, a timestamp in a, a time spec format. Uh, this is very brief. There are, is pretty good example code of this in the Linux kernel. The um, struct that's returned is essentially just an array, an array of three fields, the software timestamp, the hardware timestamp, and a deprecated field. Um, the transmit path, adding transmit timestamp is a little bit harder because on receive, you, at some point the application gets the data so you can piggyback the metadata, the timestamp with it. On transmit, this doesn't exist. So what the timestamping um, API, or the timestamping um, um, implementation does is it takes the packet that's being sent, it loops it back onto an um, even more obscure corner of the socket interface. So sockets have um, a send, receive, and error queue. So it basically uses the error queue to loop a packet back up to user space that the application first sent out. Um, the error queue was originally meant for low rate events, like if you have a datagram socket and enable SK error, and you send a packet and an ICMP response comes back for a port unreachable, you can get that message on the error queue. So it's not really meant for high performance, uh, but we, uh, we abuse it for high rate uh, applications. Um, it works a little bit different to add to the fun. It's, um, you cannot block on the error queue. So an application that wants to send a, send a message and get an, um, a timestamp and do nothing else will have to essentially block on select pull epoll. Um, and then when an error comes in, it will get unblocked even if it didn't explicitly wait for the on-pull error. It's a, it's a very peculiar interface. Uh, but this, with this, now the, um, basically the packet comes back with the uh, timestamp uh, associated with it the same way you would read it for a received timestamp. One small point is that um, on transmit, we basically only had the hardware and the software received timestamp. 
uh, um, on, oh, sorry, on reception. On the transmit part, we had those two timestamps, and then we also had a, a timestamp between TCP and the traffic shaping. And what I didn't point out is that if um, in your network stack, you can actually, a packet can traverse multiple Q disks. If you have a IP VLAN device on top of a bonding device on top of a physical NIC, that's three times calling DEF QX MIT, that's three times going through a Q disk. Um, those are three timestamps re reported. Um, so because this is essentially a variable length array, uh, what happens is at every measurement point on the transmit path, the packet gets looped back and a timestamp is reported. And we, uh, along with the SCM timestamping, C message, another C message is queued, which is uh, an error. So it's here it's called IP receiver. It could be IPv6 receiver, packet TX timestamp. Um, but it's always this, this type stock extended error and it has some information about the timestamp. So here, the origin is a timestamp. It is one of either SCED, which is the QDisk timestamp, SEND, which is the hardware or software timestamp, or ACK, which is a TCP acknowledgement coming in a very special case. And associated, it also has this, the EE data field in the extended error has an offset, and the offset is very important, I'll get to that. Um, so we can generate hardware and software received and transmit timestamps, scheduler timestamps, and this TCP acknowledgement timestamp special case. And separately, there's a bitmap to, for what kind of timestamps to report. Um, the result of this is to get a timestamp, you always have to give at least two bits in the bitmap, the, which timestamp to generate and which timestamp to report. That's why the setsock up looked the way it, it did when I showed it to you earlier. So with this, we, we basically get the picture that I showed earlier, but a little bit more concrete. So we have this, this SCM timestamping array with multiple elements annotated with whether it's a scheduler, a send, an ACK event, um, and we get these for both transmit and receive on our socket. So now we can finally answer the very simple question, was, you know, was the fault um, on the network or was it my problem? And we can actually answer a lot more. If it, is, if it is my problem, if it is a network stack, where in the network stack did this accrue? Um, so this results in a picture like, like this, where we can basically measure latencies between these stages and attribute the latency to a cost, TCP queue delay, packet schedule delay, uh, time in the network. Uh, now, these two, this is looking at two hosts, the sender side and the receiver side. These are two separate machines, obviously. They have separate clocks. So unless you synchronize your clocks, uh, you might not be able to um, compare the receive software against the receive, on the receiver, against the receive hardware on the, on the sender. But at the very least, you can subtract the, um, the, the latencies, uh, the differences, and compute the average time on the network, for instance. Um, this is one of the things that Dapper does. It takes these, this information from both sender and receiver side, puts it in the same distributed database. And the other thing it does is that there are RPCs often trigger additional RPCs to do some small bit of work for them. So you get this tree of, of RPCs, and if one of them is delayed, obviously the main one's gonna be delayed as well. So that's the kind of inference that, that a Dapper system does. Um, and here you see essentially the same picture, even larger. We have measurements points in the application, in the RPC layer, in the kernel, um, and all of this is associated with a particular RPC in this distributed system. Now I glossed over a lot of facts to make this work. I was talking about RPCs and packets. Um, we had to make three major changes to timestamping to make this work for us. So in Google, our RPCs are based on top of TCP. John previously mentioned that, you know, streaming protocols and RPCs are a really poor match. Somehow we tried to make this work. So uh, we put discrete RPCs on top of TCP, which then turns it into discrete packets again. And somehow we want to get a timestamp back for the RPC. So that's one, so adding timestamping to TCP. Initially, timestamping was a datagram mechanism only. Uh, the second is to scale it to fleet-wide, which means uh, predominantly enable sampling. And the third is, um, now that we know where uh, latency accrues, we would like to know why. So for that, especially for after-the-fact analysis, you need the system state. So when you take the timestamp, also take a, a snapshot of the relevant system state and store that alongside it. So three extensions. Um, the first one is to support TCP. 
is, as I said, what we want is timestamps for our RPCs. And uh, they, can they can differ tremendously in size from um, one byte payload to giga uh, gigabytes um, in, in, in theory. Um, what happens is like every RPC is an individual send call that passes the RPC on to TCP. And TCP has byte stream semantics. It doesn't care at all about RPCs. So TCP will decide to chop this up into packets, into SKBs, based on things like um, what is my MSS? Can I build TSO packets? Should I retransmit something? Um, shall I do MSS probing? Um, what we get from uh, SO timestamping is a timestamp for every SKB for which we request a timestamp. Which, so the, the, what we need to do is to correlate the two. The first thing um, we did here was to better define what does a TCP timestamp request mean. Um, the a request for a timestamp on a send message to CC, TCP is a request for the last byte in that buffer. And that's intuitive that if what we want to know about our RPC is when the entire RPC is ready, when the entire RPC is received uh, um, on, um, on the receiver, for instance. So in TCP, we're just going to track that last byte because TCP, everything eventually is, um, arrives in order. Then um, that TCP will be mapped onto an SKB. In some cases, if an RPC is small, multiple R requests might map onto the same SKB. Um, it, it works, Linux will just queue a, an SKB A packet with a timestamp back to user space. But the application was expecting multiple timestamps and it only gets one, so this is pretty bad. What we did for this is add um, the message end of record flag uh, behavior to TCP. So if you do a send call to TCP and pass this flag, the kernel guarantees that the subsequent data is not coalesced into the same SKB. It essentially closes that SKB that's ready for transmission. So that on the, on the transmit path gives us um, the, the capability to kind of decide the geometry of the packets on the wire. So to, to maintain some RPC geometry, even though it's supposedly a byte stream. On receive, we really want the same. So on receive, again, every packet was normally timestamped. We only care about some of the timestamps. And particularly, we want the timestamp for when a whole RPC um, has passed some point. The whole RPC has arrived. The whole RPC is copied into user space, and the process is awoken. Um, traditionally, timestamps are actually decided, um, based on the first byte or the first uh, symbol. And if you see the TCP, um, so the IP stack, IP fragmentation will actually, if you have multiple fragments and just multiple timestamps, it will choose the first, the, the oldest timestamp to report. Um, so we had to change this. And um, another thing that we, we use to make TCP work more like an RPC system is this receive low watt socket option. Receive low watt or receive low watermark is a way for a process to tell the kernel, don't wake me when a byte of data is available. I, I, there's nothing I can do with one byte. Wake me when a certain number of bytes that I find useful are ready. So it basically tells the kernel, don't call. Um, don't wake the process, don't unblock the process until, for instance, a full one megabyte RPC arrives. Um, for timestamping, we piggyback on top of that with this pull-in option, which is not upstream. It's one I added recently. Um, and with this, we changed the semantics to instead of choosing to re return the oldest timestamp um, of multiple packets that make up an RPC, is to return the timestamp that um, was uh, um, made the socket readable, essentially that is the last byte in the RPC. Um, any questions on this, by the way? Okay. Um, so the second part is easier. We want to scale this, this system up. Uh, the first thing we want to do is that there's no reason to copy data up uh, to user space. Uh, when these TCP SKBs, we don't even know really which part of, a, of an RPC they contain. Um, before we had, um, before we added this, there was no way to disambiguate timestamps. So if you send two datagrams on a UDP socket and get two timestamps, you know, um, you can guess that the order in which they came is the order of your packets, but you didn't know for sure. And the data was the way to, to double check that. So with TS only, we basically say don't um, copy data. And then we added in that instead this opt ID, which is a way to um, uh, associate a timestamp with a send call. 
And it's pretty straightforward for a datagram socket when the set sock opt SO timestamping is made with opt ID. Um, a counter is reset, and every send message for that datagram socket will increment the counter. So E data returned will be 0, 1, 2, et cetera. For TCP, because TCP is a byte stream, it's not a counter um, for every send message call, but it's the offset um, in the, uh, the sequence number, basically, of the last byte in the packet, the offset from the, from the sequence number when uh, the set sock up was made. And here I made a small mistake. Sorry. So there's opt ID and opt ID TCP. Opt ID took uh, when the set when the set sock up is made, and and the choice is made. Okay, this is the sequence number. This is now, and we're going to report an offset from now. I took the send on act, which is um, under the influence of when an act comes in. So it's essentially um, uh, um, there, there's input into that value that the, uh, the, the process doesn't control. So I had to make a new version, OptID TCP, which is based on WriteSeq, which is fully under control of the application. And unfortunately, it couldn't just fix the old flag because it's established behavior. So I had to create a new flag. So that's fairly ugly. I try not to do this too often. And that's exactly why um, the pull-in flag I showed you before, is I didn't immediately send upstream. I want to get some experience from within Google to make sure that the semantics make sense. Um, but we'll come back onto the stable API problem. And then the last part um, of making this scalable is to support um, sampling. So instead of having to do a set sock opt, uh, and that would mean that if you want to sample one out of 100 sends, for instance, you basically have to do, um, uh, for that one sample point, you have to do three uh, system calls, and at our scale, system calls are expensive. Instead, um, basically, you can pass a control message with the bitmap, and that control message overrides the per socket setting, very similar to how other C messages on, on transmit work. Then we come to the last part of the three parts, what we needed to extend timestamping with, which is we got kind of greedy. We don't just want to know where latency accrues, but we want to know why. And um, what you can do normally is like, oh, my, my connection is in a bad state. Let me call um, um, the TCP get info, or the TCP info get sock opt, and then I understand why my connection is not performing very well. But obviously, that you know that's a different point in time. So what this does, the opt stats flag, is instead of passing data along to user space, it essentially passes the TCP connection state along to user space with the timestamp. So it's recorded at the time the timestamp is recorded, and you can see interesting things such as is this connection. Um, receive window limited, right? If this receiver doesn't allow the sender to send data, obviously the data is going to sit there in the TCP socket. Um, and with this, uh, for most analysis, I'm going to refer to the um, Fathom paper. They do that a lot better than I can. But just a few small points of, of what we observed here. Uh, first one is if you look at the reason for your latency, the source where delay accrues is often not the, the, the cost, like the receive window limited is, is prime example of this. It, the data is sitting at the sender, but the problem is that the receiver isn't reading its socket quickly enough, for instance. Um, second, I started by saying that we basically had to uh, agree between the network, NetOps folks and us whether it was a kernel network stack or a network problem. Turns out for a really big application, and I think in general, the majority of the tail latency is neither. It's actually, or it wasn't either, it would turn out to be um, scheduler latency or application. It was basically the data was ready, the process was told that the data was ready, but nothing was reading the data. And that can be because the application thread is doing something else, but on a busy server, it can also just be that the, um, the thread is, is waiting to be scheduled. Right? So that's why it's important to measure on receive, when is my whole RPC available to be read? And in user space, read, um, record, when did this threat start processing it? And that latency in between is, is quite significant and it's not, never, not a networking issue. And finally, um, this morning there was the host CC talk. Now host congestion is a very interesting problem that um, a particular case of this is uh, just in cast or multiple connections um, all or multiple clients all want to talk to the same server. On a, when you have a big, big fleet like Google, this is a really common problem. Um, and we really want to measure this 
And you can see it as a special case of a delay-based congestion control. If, if you take the timestamp, the hardware receive timestamp, and the software receive timestamp, then you're basically measuring the time it takes to um, traverse the network receive, the NIC receive path, as well as any delay until the, the host gets around to reading it. Um, and you can basically see this latency going up as uh, congestion occurs here. So then you can take action early on. Um, okay. So I've talked all about timestamping. There's only one slide left, really. Uh, one of the things I showed is like we basically took a, an existing API that I think few, few people truly understand what it was doing anyway, and we added even more flags to make it even more obscure. Um, and then I made at least one mistake where I had to change a flag. So really my question is, and I don't have an answer to this, is can we, do we still need a stable API like ASO timestamping? Or can we use something like, um, well, something like trace points to implement the same thing without needing a stable API and iterate much quicker on the, on the solution. And it's really an open question. I'm very interested in this. So if anyone has data or um, has, has attempted this, uh, please let me know. There are a couple of issues I see with this approach. The first one is correlating what you're measuring with what you want to measure, right? So it's when you have a trace point or even a K probe, um, you probably have an SKB pointer, so that part correlation part's pretty easy, but SKBs get recycled, so you already have to be careful. And what we want to measure is not the SKB, we want to go through the byte stream to measure the, you know, this RPC byte. So that's actually not a straightforward mapping at all. The second big problem, um, potentially, is how expensive is it to do the measurement? Obviously also an issue with SO timestamping. We're trying to measure events at sort of microsecond scale, and um, trace points are, are very efficient, but um, I did run a little test with u probes, or, or my teammate did, and um, unsurprisingly, it uses breakpoints. Essentially, each u probe seemed to be a multi microsecond, like single digits, two microseconds or so for every u probe added. If I want to try to measure single digit latency, that's not going to work. Um, and then finally, these tools generally require super privileges, where one of the really nice features of SO timestamping is that any application can use it. So if we, if we try to replace SO timestamping with something like this, uh, we're going to have to solve that problem as well. Um, so with that, I basically you know, set the stage a little bit. Um, why would you want to do latency debugging? Um, how do we do it at Google? And how do we scale this to fleet-wide? Um, and a lot of that is based on data we get from the kernel using this timestamping API. We extended it in a variety of ways, notably adding TCP, I think that's a big one, adding sampling and, and correlation with state. Um, so with that, um, what, have any questions? That was pre-applause for the answer to the questions you're going to get now. Uh, any questions? None. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so the whole talk, I was wondering about that last slide. Okay. And I was like, this is so a thing we want to put in the ABCF, right, or something like that. Um, so that's great. But I do wonder, part of that, would that allow for transparent um, tracing of applications, like an unmodified application? It would be really great if we could get the time stamping from that. I would really like that. And that's why I played with you. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. So the, the question is, um, that last slide where we replace SO time stamping with, uh, with K probes and, and notably U probes, can we use this to measure latency in unmodified applications? And this is exactly why I ran a little test with U probes and was somewhat disappointed to see that the overhead is as high as I feared. Okay, I, I have two questions. Uh, the timestamps you're talking about are based on the CPU time, right? Um, it's a mix of both. So I did a host clock as well as uh, NIC hardware timestamps are based on the NIC clock. Mm -hmm. uh, because like, yeah, as, all, as we all know, uh, transmit timestamps on the NIC are pretty expensive. Uh, I mean, you know, it's definitely harder to get them than, than just the CPU times. Uh, but also, what is the expected performance of how many of those timestamps you require in this solution? 
So, so I think that depends. Um, the traditional way of doing transmit timestamps at the FI usually has like some fixed register file to write the timestamp in and the user space or the, the host has to pull this, this register file. That doesn't scale to, you know, tens of millions of packets per second. Um, but it is possible to, um, I guess, implement it in a different way in hardware that does scale, um, even if the timestamp might be taken earlier when the transmit completion is queued to the host. Does so, that answer your question? Sorry. Yeah, the, but what, what is the scale like? How many timestamps do you require? Um, well, we... Just a ballpark. Then. Yeah, a uh, line rate. <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, like, don't think today we need line rate because um, we, we clearly for this use case, we use it on a sample basis, uh, but I know it's possible to do it at line rate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think you might have answered my question as well. So you actually want to capture timestamps on 100% of all messages or? Not for this, not for this workload because this fleet-wide scaling inevitably requires sampling, but right. for um, delay-based congestion control algorithms, they probably want that, yes. Right, so you're so you you can you're choosing sampling at some rate, maybe one two percent, and you can turn up the dial if you want to go look for details. Or how are you? Um, that's uh, I think the, the Dapper paper did go into that. It's definitely a little bit outside my expertise, but the tricky part here is that if you are interested in an RPC, let's say like a, a Google like search query RPC, because it triggers so many other RPCs, at some level you say I need to sample, and worst case, that turns in that everything at the bottom of the tree is 100% sampling rate. So the answer is a little bit more complicated and just pick a sample rate and go with it. Hi, I, I just wanted to say that having to have it done this before, I you made a lot more progress than we did, but... Um, the one thing we ended up doing was doing using LTTNG to do the user space side because what it ends up doing is spinning up a thread and a ring buffer, a shared memory ring buffer. And so when you turn it on, it just enables those code paths and dumps it into the ring buffer, kind of like kernel does. Okay. Rather than, we tried the U probes and like you said, it, it was like, no, that's not going to scale. Yeah, so basically code rewrites um, to yeah, continuously You have to capture. opt in and put your own manual trace points in, Yeah, but that was something we were going to do anyway. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Like my understanding was that the current like user space taste points are based on u no, that's and are the, just as that's slow. The, okay. the, this is Great. LTTNG, which was the stuff the guys who did user space RCU did and all that stuff. But now. this does require um, the application. So Tom's, Tom's uh, request for like an unmodified process doesn't... Right, no, work, but right? you can just put the Mac, you know, the two-line macro call of like, oh, yes, I want to see the timestamp here when I received RPC started, whatever. Okay. Okay, it sounds like uh, we are out of questions, so... Oh, there was one more. Oh, one on the on the uh, on the monitor in front of you. Oh, sorry, I'll I'll read that. If packets containing the n bytes of an RPC are retransmitted, what timestamp do we get? The first re transmit to retransmit both, uh, which is more useful? So the answer is actually, oh, that's Arjun. That's my own teammate. Uh, <laughs> You, you get, should know. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, I think he does. I don't know. Um, you get all of them, right? So if uh, if if you request a timestamp on a sequence number and it goes through three Q disks and it gets retransmitted, you end up with six timestamps. Um, we err on the side of giving you too much data here. Though in that case, you'll have to somehow figure out the timestamp back to RPC hash or something, right? Because you could end up with the wrong understanding of the RPC timestamp if you sample incorrectly? Uh, you, you, with every timestamp, you get the sequence number and the retransmit, it's the same sequence number. I see, I see you have to map it back. Um, the one part I didn't mention is if you have three Q-disks, you have to disambiguate those and there's yet another control message that you can ask for the IP packet info to basically give you that. As I guess another question here, could any non-socket part of this also be used in forwarding? or extend towards that. I mean, they need to debug sources of variable latency even on our middle boxes. Um, that means, I guess, taking measurements on the middle box and somehow putting that in the network packet as a trailer and then reading that on the host. And the answer is yes, that, that is being done. Like different vendors of switches will put trailer timestamps in the packet. We currently don't have support for reading these in SO timestamping, um, apart from 
No, we don't edit at all. Because if you send a packet to the IP protocol stack, it will actually truncate the packet so all the trailer timestamps are not exposed to user space. You would have to read the packet socket and do it that way. But that is the INT spec, which you're talking about, right? Where you put trailer trailer timestamps along the way and every every element is free to add its yeah. own and then yeah and i could make could understand make, making it available as part of this api it's not so it wouldn't be hard to do uh, one more more common there's a new tool called redis or retis i don't know how to pronounce it that traces packets within the kernel stack maybe it can be augmented to correlate user messages to rpc as well um, okay i'll definitely look into that um, I've been very interested in, uh, in, in measuring uh, fine-grained by tracing eventually SKBs through all function calls and, and taking measurements there. Um, it seems that that's what this is doing. Thank you. Thank you, Willem. <laughs> <laughs>